Well, welcome to this presentation on using class websites on podcasts with Google Sites. I'm going to mention a few links in this presentation, and if you can't jot them down, they're on the handout in your conference pack. So the first question is, why would we want to have a class website? And there are two sort of general areas you might consider. The first is, from a teacher's point of view, it can be a place to put revision notes, sample questions, podcasts, links to web or other resources, a class calendar, and so on, lots of other uh, ideas. From a student's point of view, it can be a place to collate class projects, a place for students to form study groups and share ideas, a place for students to log their own revision, and so on. Lots of other, lots of other ideas that you could probably think of. The point is that it's worthwhile using a class website if it's worthwhile to you, in other words, if it saves time or effort. And one of the great advantages of a class website, or a website in general, is that it puts everything in one place that you and the students can access whenever you need. So why would you want to use Google Sites? Well, I hope I'm going to show you that Google Sites is very easy to use. And one important aspect which you may wish to consider is to restrict access, for example, just to your students. So I'm going to show you here a video which shows the uh, setting up and entering the first line in a Google website, and it'll be done in less than 45 seconds. So here's a video. Now, I've already got a Google account, so when I go into sites.google.com, all I need to do is click on Create New Site. I'll put in a name for my site, so I'm calling it ChemEd2010. I choose Blank Template. That saves me a lot of hassle later on, choosing a blank template. I choose a theme, so I'll go for the first one here, although I tend to spend a lot of time thinking about my themes. And then in more options, I'll say only people I specify can view this site. I type in the security code to prove I'm not a robot, and I create the site. So here's my website. This is the main page of my website. I can click on Edit Page, put in my first entry, and there we go. That's my website created with the first uh, entry. So it's really easy to use. Uh, and as you saw, restricting access is very easy. So you can now just invite students or whatever, whoever you want to ask, uh, you can just invite those to that website. Now, there's an awful lot more, obviously, than that. Um, so I've just shown you there how to set up a Google site. And there's a resource site here. You'll see in your in your conference pack, uh, there's a flyer for this resource site called Becoming an E-Teacher, which is on its own Google site. And it's essentially a five-module resource. The first module is on setting up a Google site. Then there's a module on adding content. So pictures, text, any kind of media. There's a module on accessibility. There's a module on creating and uploading PowerPoint. And there's a module on creating and uploading uh, par uh, podcasts, which we'll be looking at a little bit later on. So obviously, I'm not going to uh, go through all of these now. But if you are interested in any aspects of these, uh, you can have a look at that Becoming an E-Teacher resource. I would so say though, that Google Sites is very intuitive. It's very easy to pick up and build up slowly as, as you go along. I thought I might show you an example of a chemistry class website. So I've given you the link there. And this is a really nice example where an instructor has used a class website for a specific purpose, and that is to collate student projects on chemistry topics. So I'll click on it here, and we'll just navigate through it. So this is the class website for this uh, school. You'll see on the left-hand side here, they've created several pages. So this is very easy. You just go Create Page, and you can give it a name. So each one of these links here are a sub-page in this class website. If I click on the first page, you see here it goes to a list of student names and links. So this is what these instructors have used this website for, to collate all of the student projects on these uh, variety of chemistry topics. So if I click on a link, for example, Alternative Energy Sources, this now goes to a separate Google site. You see that highlighted there. It's a separate website. So this is a website the student has created using Google Sites, and it's been linked from the teacher's site. And you see here the student has created a website. It has lots of uh, pages. You can incorporate pictures and links easily. And on the left-hand side, the student has added several pages to their website to go through the various topics, in this case, on alternative energy sources. So this is just a really nice way now be, uh, for the uh, instructor to see all the um, files that the students have created and for students to see each other's files. And the point is that they're all collated in one place. 
The instructors also has also used a calendar to indicate uh, key dates. And you see here different instructors or different classes have different uh, sets of students. They've also added in some additional notes. So here's some information on referencing. Uh, they've added in some information on um, uh, assessment. Google Sites will automatically add a site map, that link at the bottom. And at the top is some information on just the actual assessment component itself. That, I thought that was just a really nice example of um, a, a website with a purpose, um, where the, the instructor has uh, added instructions on a, on a um, resource, calendar, information on referencing, information on assessment. And the key point is, is here that the advantage to the teacher is that it's all in one location. Student work is hosted on their own sites, and it's all linked from the teacher's site. So the student probably add that link themselves. So I think this is a really nice way, and it shows the added benefit of using a class website over a paper resource. And I think whenever you go down this road of uh, thinking about a new technology, you should always ask yourselves, what is the added benefit? OK, so I'd just like to mention briefly then this idea of podcasting. And podcasting is an audio broadcast which can be listened to on a PC or an MP3 player. But very often podcasting would include uh, uh, video or screenshots in, in, in the way that this broadcast does. This would be technically called a screencast or a videocast. And we can very easily link podcasts into Google Sites. So why would you consider podcasting? Well, when you look at the literature on podcasting in education, there tends to be three separate reasons why people would podcast. The first is it can be used to review material you may have already covered in class. And this is called substitutional podcasting, where you're reviewing material already covered. In a way, it's probably the most teacher-centered of podcasting, because really all you're doing is giving the same amount of information again. The second type of podcasting is revision uh, uh, podcasting, or what's called supplementary podcasting. In other words, where you're giving a few prompts, you're maybe saying, try these questions out, uh, and so on. So this is now taking uh, this, the um, engagement one step further. You're saying, well, we covered this in class. Here are some additional material I'd like you to try. Uh, um, in, in order to revise what we've looked at. And the third type is creative podcasting, where you're actually getting students to create material themselves. So really, as we go down these three types of podcasting, we're move, moving from a very teacher-centered approach to a student-centered approach. Now, on the resource Becoming an eTeacher, which I showed you, there is a module on podcasting. And the easiest way to start podcasting is to use free software, which is called Audacity. You can download Audacity. There's a link on this website which will um, you can download, and it's a really easy uh, software program to use. So on the Becoming an eTeacher website, it goes through uh, how to use Audacity, how to download it, how to install it, and so on. This is just a screenshot of Audacity itself, and you can see in the top left-hand corner of the program, there's a play button, stop button, record button. So it's literally as simple as open up Audacity, press record, and start talking. And this will, uh, you'll be able to save your file as an MP3 file, uh, an audio file. You can then link that uh, onto Google Sites uh, very, very easily. So how might you record? Well, you could use a microphone and a PC. That's what I'm using for this presentation. You could record directly if you have a laptop with an open microphone. This tends to be a little bit noisy uh, on uh, Dell laptops and, and Windows laptops. Uh, Macintosh laptops are much better for recording directly. iPhones or other smartphones, now most of those have um, recording um, functions so that you can record directly onto your onto your phone and then move that MP3 player onto your computer. Or you can buy digital voice recorders. Um, and Again, th these are essentially what has been done on the phone and you, you record that and put it onto your computer. Unfortunately, with uh, audio, really, it, it does tend to see, seem that the more expensive the recording device, the, the, the better quality of the audio. But once you've got a decent quality audio, um, the microphone I'm using was about 50 euro. So you can uh, gather, guess yourselves whether that was a, a good quality mic or not. So once you've recorded your audio that you want your podcast to be, you can very easily edit it in Audacity. So if you said something you didn't want to say, you can cut it out. If you need to re-record something and add it in, you can paste it in. It's really easy. It's very easy software to use. So the Becoming an eTeacher resource goes through Audacity step by step, talks about how you record uh, podcasts, edit them, and so on.